Welcome to AndyTube and my first video of the year. I want to wish all of you a happy, healthy, and prosperous year in 2018. In this video, I'll be talking about the last trio of all metal machines made by Symanco, the Singer Manufacturing Company. And by trio, I mean that Singer manufactured and marketed these three models in the United States as the second generation of slant needle machines. The revolutionary Singer Model 301A was the first slant needle machine. After this 400 series of machines, they came out with the Rocketeers which was a duo of models 500A and 503A that followed the 400s. And they were still all metal machines. Now a couple of years after the Rocketeers, they came out with a whole line of touch and sew series machines, uh, like the 600E, 604, 609, 11, 20, 25, 26, 28, 630, etc. And those started out as all metal until the existing stock of metal gears was depleted at the factories and they started using the new plastic gears. Now I've heard plenty of singer repairmen call the touch and sew models touch and swear and touch and toss. And I never met a repairman who liked the wind in place bobbin system that they use. But let's get started with this trifecta of fabulous 400 series models and we'll look at the build and features on them. This is Fleetwood, a Slantomatic Model 401A, advertised by Singer as the world's first automatic with a slant needle and gear drive. Singer called it the greatest sewing machine ever built. This is Regina, a slant omatic model 403A special, the world's first semi automatic with a front drop in bobbin. Singer called it the finest semi-automatic sewing machine ever built. Last but not least, this is Sarge, a slant needle 404. Singer called it the finest straight stitch sewing machine ever built, with all mechanisms completely enclosed and an elevator type throat plate. Now first, let's look at what the models all have in common. As I mentioned, these are the second generation slant needle machines. But what is a slant needle and what was the big deal about it? If we take a look here, you can see that the nose is slanted and that the needle bar and presser bar are slanted. And Singer built it with an incline of about nine degrees slanted towards the operator. Now some people believe Singer did this to increase penetration power of the needle, but that's really a mistaken belief. The sole purpose of the slant needle is to give you a full view of the work area. The inclined needle system puts the work in your direct line of vision. It moves the needle over an inch closer to you so you can see it better than the standard vertical needle machine that they'd made for a hundred years. A sewing machine is all about making that lock stitch. That's what it's made for. That's what it's all about. And being able to see the work area better gives you more control 
and more accuracy. Now, along with the slant needle on all three of these models, Singer made them with a horizontal rotary hook put right up front. And they use the drop-in class 66 bobbin system accessible by a slide plate. And the bobbin can easily be taken out or put in, just dropped in, front drop-in bobbin. Now before these like with the 301, they had a vertical needle under the lift-up table over here with the same bobbin system of the 221 featherweight. So this was quite a big change. Now you can remove this bobbin holder also can be removed by lifting up on the positioning spring, sliding it right, and you can pull out the all metal, whoops, I gotta get the feed dogs up out of the way a little bit. You can pull out this all metal bobbin holder so you can clean it. You can clean in the hook area with your lint brush or vacuum. As a matter of fact, this rotary hook was very different, so let me let me show it to you. Here's the hook system. It's in the same in all of these models. This is the base for it. And this is the actual whoop, horizontal rotary hook system. The hook shaft. And right there is the hook point. And it turns around. For every two revelations, it forms one stitch. You can see it's all the whole systems, very heavy duty metal. And there's a close up view of the hook. Another new feature of these three machines is the elevated needle plate or throat plate. Instead of a mechanism to lower the feed dogs down, what Singer did was put in this positioning lever. Now they call the needle plate the throat plate and this is the throat plate positioning lever. By moving it up like that, it raises the needle plate or throw plate up above the level of the feed dogs. So you can do free motion show, uh, sewing, monogramming, darning very easily and just drop that plate back down for normal sewing. If you move this lever completely to the left, that raised the needle plate up high enough that you can slide it right off. So you could change needle plates if you wanted to. You could get in here to clean out all the lint and so forth around the feed dog and the back of the hook. It was a very easy uh, feature. No, no screws, nothing like that. Then of course, you could just slide the plate back on and then lower the lever, which is spring loaded positioning pins there would just lock it right into place. The bed on all three of these models is the same, and it's 16 and a half inches end to end and it's seven inches deep from front to back. The bed, the upright, and the arm are all made from cast aluminum. 
and there is a little bit over seven inches of space from the centered needle to the base of the upright. And there's about five inches of space from the top of the bed to the bottom of the lampshade. So this gave you a nice big work area. Plenty of working room there. If we come up from that working bed, then we can see our thread, needle thread tension unit. Zoom in a little on that. And again, this is the same on all three machines. It's also made with all metal parts and it can be completely removed from the machine for cleaning or to change a worn out check spring. Um, it has a numerated dial and you can easily adjust it to the desired tension for different situations. And it's easy to disassemble for cleaning as time goes by. Here's a closer look at that thread tension unit. You can see the tension disc there under my thumb. The numerated dial from zero up to nine. Very strong, simple, accurate needle thread tension unit. All three of these models have the same type of nose plate. It was made to just swing open for easy access to the needle bar pressure bar take up lever area. So it's very easy to clean out the lint, clean it out, put oil in there. On the inside of the face plate is a threading diagram for the needle thread and a threading diagram for the for the uh, bobbin case. So very easy reminder of the proper way for the threading. And even that diagram is paint on a aluminum metal plate. The presser bar lifter is a heavy duty solid metal triple chromed. It's right back here on the back of the nose. Let's salute to uh, Let's see if I can zoom out a little bit maybe. Yeah, a little better look at that. Very easy to reach through from the front and raise or lower the presser foot. Mm -hmm. Back in the front on these models is a swing up bobbin winder system. It's stored right there out of the way but when you want to wind a bobbin, you swing this up and you press the friction ring or rubber tire up against the collar on the side of the hand wheel. Put your bobbin on here and on the hand wheel and stop motion screw, it's very easy hold the hand wheel, turn the stop motion screw, most people call it a knob, turn it to the left, that releases pressure on the washer system. So now when the motor runs, the hand wheel will spin, turning the rubber tire and your bobbin. When you're finished, hold the hand wheel, turn it right, and that will re-engage the needle and feed dog. So when you're going to wind, you can release that stop motion and just wind the bobbin without putting wear and tear on the hook, the feed dog, or the needle. 
mechanisms. Down here on the front corner of the machine, it has its own uh, spool pin and the bobbin winder tension disc assembly. So you can just put your spool of thread right there, put it through the tension disc, up on your empty spool, clip it on, put it up, release the knob, run the motor to fill it, and you're done. A very, I, I guess simple would be the way to design it. Simple but well designed and heavy duty. I call it the forever bobbin winder because there's really nothing to go wrong. There is a heavy duty spring in here not like the dinky little spring on the 500 A and 503 A that always seem to break. It's just going to last forever. Maybe in your lifespan you'll put a couple new rubber tires on there but other than that it's always good to go. Let's talk about the motor system for these machines. They all have the same motor. And this is what it looks like. It sits in the machine like that. And it sits right inside the upright. It's a PA style motor that first came with the 301A and it's a 0.7 amp motor that can peak at almost an amp. So it's a little more powerful than the first generation of the slant needle motors. The power comes through a receptacle on the bottom side of the base down here and there's wires in the back of that that go up to the light and that go to the motor and just plug in right on those two brass pins right there. Other than that, the motor's all enclosed. Now you do have access if you ever need to change the motor carbons in the future. Um, the receptacle is something like this where the cord plugs in down below there wires come off of these connectors up to the light and then here's your two short leads with little clips that just plug right on the motor so no screwing wires or clamps or anything onto the motor plug it in unplug it I've never been able to find out what the PA stands for in the PA motor. Um, the po motor numbers were stamped into the Bakelite on the bottom here. Um, this is a PA 10-8 motor. You'll see PA 8s and PA 9s. Some of them were different voltages. Um, depending on the country you lived in and even different AC voltages for across the country and they could also run on DC current. So I've just always considered that the PA stands for phenomenally, phenomenally awesome motor. <laughs> so You'll notice at the top of this, you see the motor shaft, and there's a worm gear screwed onto the shaft. And that worm gear s sits back on the edge of the hand wheel gear, and the two mate up, and that's what runs the power mechanical power through the whole machine. There's no belt. Now this is what the hand wheel looks like. Of course I've got the stop motion knob off. 
but that's the hand wheel there's the gear so the motor worm gear and the hand wheel gear mesh up so when the motor turns the hand wheel spins and here's a rarely known fact some people call it the secret but to me it's not a secret but these machines are referred to as all metal and especially because they have all metal gears but that's really not true the gear on the hand wheel is plastic it's not made out of metal but it's a real special kind of a plastic it's called texto light T-E-X-T-O-L-I-T-E -E, texto light Texto light was invented by General Electric in the 1930s. And this gear is made with woven fibers, textile fibers, impregnated with Bakelite plastic. Bakelite had been around quite a while. And I think it was that combination of textile fibers and Bakelite is why they call it Texto Light. But I've never seen or even heard of a Texto Light gear cracking, breaking, or wearing out. I'd like to have a truck made out of Texto Light because <laughs> it seems so durable, lightweight, and strong. But now you know that even in the all-metal vintage singers, there was a plastic gear. Back on the front of the machine, we can see the feed regulator controls. Now most people think of this and call it a stitch length control or stitch length regulator but it's really called the feed control because what it controls is the movement of the feed dog how far does that feed dog move between the movement of the needle bar because the needle just goes up and down and if zig if it's a zigzag machine it goes up and down and side to side but it doesn't go front to back the feed dog feeds the fabric under the needle and this controls how much how far that feed dog moves with each stitch from six stitches per inch down to about 25 or even 30 stitches per inch is what this lever does. So the farther it moves the fabric between needle strokes the longer the stitch. And when you set it to like 12, that means it's going to move the fabric in 12 little increments per inch. So you have 12 stitches per inch or a lot shorter, finer stitch. And this system is the same on all three of these models. Now moving up a little bit on the front of the machine, Singer has what they call built-in light. And the cover for that light is called the lamp shade. So the idea being that it's shaded to light up the work area and no light in your eyes. Let me remove the lamp shade so I can show you the actual light socket. And the lampshade style is different 
on the 401A, just the shape of it. And on the 403, it has one screw to hold it instead of two. But they all mount right on the front and they all serve the same purpose, to shade the light from your eyes while you're sewing. Inside that lamp cover, there's what's called a focusing lens. You see that kind of bubble there. This was, it's thick glass, and the idea is to focus the light right down on the work area here. And that focusing lens is held in by one screw and a clamp. It's in a groove. It can be removed if you want to change to an LED light. And here's the actual socket for the light. Bake light. You see the wiring going up here through the arm. It'll end up down on the receptacle by the motor. There's, it has its own on and off switch. Just right that. Just a roll switch or turn switch. And as with most Singer machines, it's a bayonet style bulb mount. So you push it in and turn it a little eighth of a turn and pull it out. And there's little pins at 180 degrees on the base of the bulb. So you push it in, the pins go in a little groove, you push it all the way in against the spring clips and you turn it towards you and it locks in place. Same type of system on all three of the machines. What I want to do next is open up Sarge's bottom plate on the 404 here and show you everything that's inside the bottom. So let me get set up to do that. All three of the machines have this kind of a bottom plate cover plate, oil pan, drip pan. There's just one big thumb screw. Should be a felt protector. And the plate just comes off. And the plate's lined with a heavy duty felt liner to absorb any dripping oil or grease. And then everything is exposed. Now the main claim to these models, and what they were talking about, gear driven, and they started this on the Slantomatic 301 for the Slantomatics. But here's a solid steel gear, and it's paired up. There's a 90 degree gear system here. One gear is attached to the shaft that goes up top to the hook. The other gear is attached to the hook driving shaft that runs right through here. And then there's another 90 degree system where it mates with the gear on the bottom of the vertical shaft that goes up to the top. And I'll be showing you that later. And these gears are, are really quite amazing. Um, they were, mm, you know, cut in pairs at the factory. And they were meshed together and run, mechanically run, inside uh, containers of cutting compound and polishing compound. So they just really mesh perfectly and smoothly. And that's why if you're ever working on the machines for adjustments, you never want to change the mesh on the gear. Like to set timing, you loosen this gear over here so that you can set the hook to needle timing on this side but you don't ever want to take the gear off and lose that mesh 
or if you do you want to mark it real good with a scratch or permanent ink so when you put it back you put it back in the exact same position I mean if you don't do that it'll run but it'll never be as quiet and smooth okay now over here you can see the base of that PA motor right there and this is a bracket that keeps that motor in place and it covers up the electrical connection let me take this big screw off here and I'll show you <clears throat> now the motor itself isn't attached in the body or screwed to it or bolted to it or anything like that there's a bracket you can see on my YouTube channel a video a couple of them how to change the motor and take it out but you can see here the electrical connections from the back of the receptacle uh, there's wiring that's going up to the light and these two little tails here come and plug right into the motor and the motor itself if you remember what it looked like it's got this aluminum tube up and then the shaft coming out with the worm gear well this aluminum tube fits inside an aluminum tunnel that's built up and in there and that's to hold it perfectly in place for the gear meshing and then this bracket when you put it on I'm gonna put it back on here the bracket is just curved here at the bottom and that rests on the curve of the motor and it just applies some pressure to it to keep the motor from slipping down and to keep it up in place now um, here is a hook see if I'm backed out all the way here here is a hook driving shaft what it looks like with the two gears that's what sits up here like this and, and uh, I talked about the bottom of the vertical shaft well this is the vertical shaft that goes up through the upright next to the motor and these two gears over here from the hook shaft and the vertical shaft they mesh together and these are solid solid steel gears these are some uh, from a 500A but it's the same same principle probably the same gears <laughs> but I thought you might like to see that it's hard to see inside the body and then down here going horizontal uh, across the body there are I can, get them out here well it looks like I only got one of them here there are these um, steel bars or shafts that operate the movement of the feed dogs one rocks them in kind of an oscillating pattern and the other controls uh, how far Okay, so the feed regulating shaft rocks at how far, and uh, this shaft actually is the rocking motion kind of up and down. And they're also steel. So that's why they call these all metal machines down here. So that's what the bottom looks like. And... Uh, I guess one more thing I could show you here when I move that positioning lever for the uh, needle plate this is the actual bracket system right here so when you move that lever 
that bracket is what moves and pushes on the bottom of those positioning pins to raise them or lower them. And that guides right through the hook base up there that I showed you holds the hook. So that is the underside of a 404 but again it's the same for all three of these models. Exact same system. Now starting with Sarge the 404 let's take a look at the individual features of the different models. So this is Sarge model 404. Singer called it the finest straight stitch sewing machine ever built. I think of it as a heavy duty hero. Now one of the things you may have noticed right in the beginning is there's not the letter A in the name. It's a 404. The other 403A, uh, 401A in the background, this was just the 404. The letter A in the Singer machine designates the machine was made in Anderson, South Carolina, and the 404 was not made there. Now, popular belief is that all these machines were made in Anderson, South Carolina, but the 404 was made in the Singer factory in Elizabeth, New Jersey. They were made there from 1958 through 1960. And Singer uh, designated 400,000 serial numbers for the 404. And then, for unknown reasons, 1,500 more serial numbers were allotted for production in 1963. Now, I don't think anybody knows today how many of those 401,500 serial numbers were actually built, how many machines were actually built of that number. Now, there was a model, and there is a model, 404G. The G means it's made in Germany. Uh, I've only seen pictures of it. I don't know much about it other than I remember that the bobbin winder system was kind of up here on the top. Maybe a precursor to the 500A type bobbin winding system. Now you can find negative reviews about the 404, but they mostly tried comparing it to the model 301A and that's a big mistake in my opinion because the 404 uses a totally different hook and bobbin system that's here in the front instead of underneath on the side. Um, the 301A was made as a lightweight 16 pound machine that could be put in a cabinet cradle mount to be used in the cabinet or with its built-in handle up here you could release it from the cradle and pull it right out of the cabinet with the handle and use it as a portable machine. Now the difference with that is the 404 was built as a much more heavy-duty machine. It has bigger bushings and counterweights, reinforced presser and needle bars, a structurally stronger cast body all weighing at almost 22 pounds. So I think it's wrong to call the 404 the new 301A just as it was wrong to call the 301A the new 201. They are all actually very different models. And you see on the front here that really the only controls were for the feed regulator and the needle thread tension unit. That was it. Because it's a straight stitch machine. Now let's take the arm cover off and the nose cover and I'll show you what's, what, what's under those covers. Um, you see up here on the top of all these covers there's going to be two large screws that are just lefty loosey and you pull those two screws out and you lift the cover straight up. So let me get that ready. Okay, with those two large screws removed now, 
we can remove the needle plate or the arm cover plate and we just want to lift it straight up. The only thing you got to be careful of is this big chrome knob over here doesn't scratch the paint as you take it off. That's why it's best to lift it straight up. This is also cast aluminum. Nice thick, thick metal. The nice enamel type paint. You get that out of the way. And um, let's take a look. Let me turn this around. We'll take a look first in the nose here. So, of course, the nose cover swings open. I showed you that before. The 404 has a little clip here that clips on to the needle bar bushing to keep it steady. And you, you remove this, there's two little hinge pins or swing pins that are built into the nose cover that go in little holes of the body. And to me that's the only weak point on the whole machine because a lot of people break these pins or, or crack the housing for them when they take them off. So the cover has to be off to remove the nose cover and the best thing to do is just to move it up and I mean like a sixteenth of an inch so those pins will come out of the little holes. Now you see I'm tilting the top away a little bit and then pulling the bottom out. So just like that. And here you can see the bottom pin and the top pin. And you see that housing isn't that big. So a lot of people will pull it up from the bottom and twist it and break the pins. So just be careful to lift it straight up just a little bit, tilt the top and pull out the bottom. Then you can safely remove that cover. And the first thing you're going to see up here is this big chrome thumb screw. And that controls the pressure amount on the presser bar and presser foot. So when it's down, if you turn this in a clockwise manner, it screws this thumb screw in, which puts more and more pressure down on this big steel pin. And there's a big spring inside here, and that's what you control the pressure with. If you're going to sew lighter weight fabric, you turn it counterclockwise, and that releases pressure, so there's less and less pressure. And you can do this very incremental. The modern machines might have settings, one, two, three, four, five, but this you can make little tiny increments. So you can set it perfectly for what you're sewing. And look, it's just a big chrome thumb screw, a steel pin, a steel um, presser bar, and this heavy duty 404. See if I can get down here and get you a better look at this. These bushings are bigger and longer than a standard bushing. They're a little bit thicker and heavier. So more reinforcement. That was part of Singer's heavy duty thing with this. And you see up here the thread take up levers and connecting links. And get a little better light on them. These are all heavy duty metal. They're all nice and thick metal. And the link connects right into a thicker heavier a needle bar counterweight right here on the end of the horizontal arm shaft. That gives it a little more driving power. So again, all of this reinforced 
heavier bushings and pieces of metal were to go with Singer's point of calling this a heavy duty machine. Okay, let's see if I got a, yeah, here's a, here's a similar type needle bar. You can see how that nice solid metal, it's hollow down about the top third is hollow. Then the rest is solid. And let's see if I got a presser bar. I thought I had a, yeah. Here's a nice uh, presser bar and presser foot with the bushing pulled out of a machine. Nice steel. Good heavy duty. Take a look at some modern machines. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, that's what the the nose and looks looks like, you know. Um, so let's um, look inside the arm cover up on top. Let me reposition this. Okay, up here now we can see this nice heavy uh, horizontal arm shaft. This is the main arm shaft that goes through to the nose and the counterbalance is screwed to it. It goes all the way through all the connections and through to the end and into the hand wheel area where the hand wheel is screwed right onto the end of it. And then over here you're going to see these heavy uh, connections right here. Let's see, here's here's a, this is from a 403, but you'll get the idea. This one has a worm gear for a cam stack and the 404 doesn't, but this is, this is what it looks like. So the counterbalance inside the hand wheel screwed in here, the hand wheel screwed on the end. Um, this is the forked feet connection rocker arm connection and the heavy uh, steel gear you can see how that looks that meshes with the gear on the top of the vertical shaft if you remember that vertical shaft and uh, let's see here's the forked feed connection let me zoom out a little bit here I think I'm Oh, I am out. Okay. Here's what the fork feed connection that's sitting right here looks like. Goes down to the feed horizontal shaft I was showing you on the bottom. Nice metal. Here's the rocker arm connection that you see right there and it fits right there and there's a uh, whoop, turn that around. there's a clamp that goes over the top to hold it and that goes down and that that's what makes the kind of the elliptical rocking of the feed dog that's what helps drives that on the bottom so that's what's connected next um, you remember the horizontal steel shaft with the gear on the top. That's what meshes like that in there. It's kind of hard to see down in there, but that's where the shaft sits down in there and meshes like that. And you remember the bottom of the shaft made it up with the gear to the hook drive shaft. Okay, so that's what those parts look like in these machines and in here is a nice heavy bushing and over at this end is a nice heavy bushing with oil ports you know and you can see how beautiful and simple that machine is motor turns the hand wheel on these eccentric gears the two shafts going down rock and move the vertical shaft is turned by these steel gears 
and then the shaft just continues on through the nose with the nose end counterbalance up there that the needle bar connecting link is in. And way back in this corner you can see the top of that motor shaft and maybe you can make out the worm gear right there mating with the textolite gear right there. So when that motor turns the hand wheel turns which starts all the mechanical motion of the machine. Okay, so that's what it looks like under the top arm cover of the 404. With all that heavy duty and strong steel, it's easy to see why Singer called it the finest straight stitch sewing machine ever made. This is Regina, a Model 403A Special Singer sewing machine. Singer called it the finest semi-automatic machine ever built. I call it the queen of zigzag machines. This machine was built in Anderson, South Carolina between 1958 and 1960 and Singer allotted 300,000 serial numbers for this model. Now what's so special about the 403A? If we look at the front of the machine we see some additional controls here that the 404 didn't have. You're going to see a stitch width control lever for the zigzag with a little notch out for straight stitch and then pushing down and depressing the lever and sliding it to widths between 0 and 5. And we'll also see a push and slide lever over here that's used to position the needle left, center, or right. So if we push it in and up the needle bar moves to our left. We push it in and slide it back to the middle, it's the center, and if we push it in and slide it to the bottom, it moves the needle to the right. So those are really the only controls added for the Singer 403A. And you notice that just like the feed regulator and the thread tension control, it's right up here on the front, right at eye level, so it's easy to use these controls. Now you've seen a lot of zigzag machines with these basic setups. Control the length of the stitch, control the width of the stitch. And many models have a left center right needle bar control. But if we look up here on the top of the arm, we start to see some differences. Let's see if I can get this set up here to look at. And maybe I can raise this up a little. There we go. So what's up here is two spool pins, first off. And that's because the 403A can use double needles. You can put two regular needles into the needle holder or needle clamp and you can run two threads through the tension unit and down and through the two needles and you can sew double stitching. And you can do that in forward and reverse, straight or zigzag. And you can do that at any length of stitch. So that's why you're seeing two uh, spool pins up there. And it just uses the same needles as when as a regular singer, single needle. It just can hold two of them. Now this arm cover 
has a flip up top and inside if I open it you can see the special disc and it comes shipped from the factory with this disc number zero which is for zigzag now every zigzag machine has to have a zigzag disc or cam and many regular zigzag machines just have a zigzag cam built right in but what makes this special is that these discs can be removed and replaced with other pattern discs you just grasp it and pull it out and this is a very classic disc from Singer it's called a top hat cam and it's a three hole disc the large center hole the hole on the guide post and the small hole later versions in the fashion disc and into the 700 series I think these had four holes but they're a little bit different height and they don't always work in these earlier machines like the 403A and the 401A to remove or replace the special disc the needle has to be up out of the fabric and it should be set to straight stitch all the way to the left and then you just pull it up and push it on there's a little three piece spring there that it snaps onto now the machine came not only with this disc but eight other special discs, eight other patterns. And Singer made a total of 22 of these early discs, 22 different patterns. Now let me take this top off like we did on the 404 <clears throat> and we can take a look and we can see what's different in the 403A up here on the top end. So again, like most Singer machines, there's going to be two screws up here to hold the arm cover. And again, we're going to lift it straight up. We still have a large chrome pressure control knob. So we want to watch that and pick this straight up. And you don't want to lift it by the flip-up cover. You might damage the hinge. So always just grab the main body of the arm cover and lift it straight up and off of that chrome knob. So in here you can see a couple different things. You can see these spring hinges that control the flip up cover and then the flip up cover itself like that. And now let's look into this top cover. What's under the top cover, I mean. And down in here, you're still going to see many similar parts to the 404. It's got a main horizontal arm shaft the bearings. Over on this side you can still see the worm gear from the motor mating with the hand wheel gear, that textilite gear. That's all the same. And down in here you have your forked feet connection, rocker arm connection, uh, the steel gear that mates with the steel gear on the top of the vertical shaft. But now we've got some new parts. And this is all for the zigzag. So let me have this make sure this is in the straight stitch position. I'll pull this cam off.
And you can see a large center post here. That's what the cam sits on, or the special disc. And you can see the, the little three-piece spring there that holds the disc on. Now I'm going to move this needle positioning lever up and down. See if you can, well, you can see some, can't see it too good. Let me see if I can tilt this a little more. You can see some parts back here that move when you move that lever. And you see this here? So as I push in and move that arm uh, needle positioning left, center, right, you see some parts in the back there sliding up and down. And it also moves this. And this is the uh, needle bar vibrating arm or needle bar driving arm. And it's connected to this and the equipment for the disc and some levers push this panel and that's what's going to move let's get this over to width 5 here that's what's going to make this arm swing or vibrate and that's what's going to move the needle bar you can see the needle bar up here top of it moving left to right So that needle bar driving arm is what's going to, to cause that zigzag movement. Now this is what that arm looks like out of the machine. Oops, actually it sits down there. This goes into the bottom of the byte amplitude selector right here, that big silver disc. And that is um, Byte amplitude is Singer's word for zigzag. So byte amplitude selector, this driving arm goes in the bottom of it, and that's what positions it to how far it's going to swing that needle. And some levers push on this, called a paddle, that makes the arm swing. And these connectors here go right through into the front of the machine into the nose area and they attach to what's called the needle bar vibrating, vibrating bracket. This is all metal, nice nice heavy piece of metal here. And then let's see if I have the bite amplitude selector. I do have one. So this piece there's a post that goes down, screws right into the body of the machine, and that would hold the pattern disc and would also hold a cam stack if there was a cam stack. The 403 really doesn't have a cam stack, meaning a stack of cams. It just takes one cam or special disc. Oops, let me move that back pop that on so that when it's turning these followers and pins follow the pattern on there and move that needle bar driving arm to create the zigzag movement. <clears throat> so the way that that width or bite amplitude adjusts is with this byte amplitude selector. It sits right on that post and this is where the selector lever is screwed to and as it moves that needle bar driving arm it's got a like a ball joint into the bottom right there that's what moves 
and changes the width of the stitch. So that sits down over that post and then the pattern selector in this case sits on top of it. So you've got that part moving with stitch width and you've got the needle positioning left center right brackets and mechanisms along the side and the back. And that's all different on the 403A. That's what's making it a zigzag machine. The other parts up here are similar to the 404. I would say that the, the shafts and the bushings are not quite as heavy duty as the 404, but they're still very very strong and capable. Okay, I've got Regina turned around here and lifted up a little bit so we can see in behind the nose cover. This nose cover, when the uh, arm cover is taken off, it'll just swing open. There's not a little catch down here because the needle bar bushing on the 403 isn't as big and reinforced as the 404. So there's actually a little silver ball up here that pops under a spring on the arm cover and that's what keeps it closed. But it comes off the same way just gently lift it up a little bit and yeah see this has been damaged you tilt the top out and pull it off I don't know if you'll be able to see that there's a little crack in this arm that holds the pin and the pin is starting to come out a little bit see that pins kinda loose in there so I'm probably gonna have to use some uh, JB weld or something so that that doesn't get worse but that was from somebody twisting it and prying it off that's why I mentioned on the 404 that's the only weak, weak spot to me on the machine <laughs> but if you if you just careful with it you won't have a problem and it still has the thread guide inside as before but you see now um, this is the adjustment for the presser bar pressure and it's the same way clockwise to put more pressure counterclockwise to release but it doesn't go straight down into the presser bar anymore because they had to put this mechanism right here and you can see part of the control for the presser bar goes right through it and the needle bar goes through it and this is the needle bar vibrating bracket or the swing needle mechanism it's that mechanism connected to the end of the needle bar driving arm that makes the needle swing back and forth for zigzag so that's why this can pressure control had to be offset a little bit to make room for all this and then at the top of the pin for the presser bar they put a disc so the pressure is set still at the top of this pin which goes down into the presser bar and the spring and so forth but this has been added it's still all metal. It's still all metal take up levers and connecting links for the thread take up lever. There's still a nice big um, counterbalance, needle bar counterbalance at the end of the arm shaft. I don't think it's quite as heavy as the 404 but it's a very good size, a lot bigger than you'll see like in the 301. 
Okay, so that is all added for the zigzag. Now we've, we've looked at before at the throat plate or needle plate positioning bracket and how it can raise that plate up for darning or raise it up even higher for uh, removal. Let me get this position right there. I should be able to... I got it up there now. I haven't restored these machines yet so it might be kind of kind of kind of sticky but this machine besides having the straight stitch needle plate came with a general purpose needle plate because you can't use a little hole for a zigzag stitch so you need a wider opening that can accommodate it so this is called the general purpose foot or plate. A lot of people call it the zigzag plate. And it came with a general purpose foot or the zigzag foot versus only the straight stitch foot that's on the 404. Because this machine can straight stitch or zigzag and pattern with the pattern cams. Let me just put that back in there. Just wanted to show you that. Move that lever back and lock the plate back in. So you can see now why it's special. It's not just a zigzag or a zigzag machine with one cam, like a blind hem cam or something like that, it actually came with the zigzag disc installed and it came with eight more feet and then there's about 13 more of these, not feet, these discs, eight more of these special discs or pattern discs and you can buy about 13 more of them that will fit this machine. That's what makes it special. It still has all the other features of the 404. But that's Regina, the queen of special zigzag machines. And there it is, the machine you've been waiting for. <laughs> Fleetwood. The Model 401A Slant-O-Matic Special Automatic Sewing Machine. Singer called it the greatest sewing machine ever built. And it came to be known as the Cadillac of sewing machines. Back in the late 50s and early 60s, Cadillac was one of the finest luxury cars made in America. So that's what people started calling it, the Cadillac of sewing machines. It was built in Anderson, South Carolina between 1956 and 1961. So the first production units were run off in 1956, but it wasn't marketed and sold until early 1957 and Singer allotted 1 million serial numbers for this machine. This is what they banked on. They spent a lot of money designing this machine and tooling the factory to make this machine. And it was the most expensive of course of the three models and it had the biggest profit margin of the three models. Singer really pushed this machine at all of its stores. Um, they wanted you to buy this machine over the other two. They had more than twice as many as the other models. They would offer you uh, time payments. 
they would uh, give you discounts on cabinets. Uh, it came with five of the special discs, but they throw in a few more maybe. Uh, maybe a couple extra presser feet to get you to buy this machine. And if we look at the front control panel now, well, it's really different, isn't it? <laughs> so, I mean, we still have the feed control, and we still have the uh, needle thread tension unit, and the little flip-up bobbin winder system with its own spool and tension disc, the throat plate positioning lever, you know, all that's the same. But look at this front control. If I can get a little closer there. Wow. Hmm. Um, this whole, these knobs and this plate and this lever were all part of the uh, stitch selector controls. And this is the famous or infamous red lever. Wow. And you see it's in kind of a little notch up position there. Got a little arrow pointing to it. What would be stitch width 3. And that's kind of a special place for the red lever which I'll get into. And then you see it's got a couple of knobs here. This brown one is called the outer knob. And the ivory one back here is called the inner knob. Now a lot of people call them front and back. But technically Singer called them outer and inner. And this plate you see it has many A, B, C, D, E, F, like that. And it's got a little positioning pin indicator. And this side of the plate comes up where this leaves off on J. This side starts on the bottom with K, L, M, N, O, P, like that, up to R. And then at the very top, special. Okay. And this has a bigger flip-up cover. Uh, built into the main arm cover. And inside there is quite a chart of all these uh, primary stitches that were available to be set with these controls. So it talks about AK3 is for straight stitch. It talks about you can use two needle. Straight stitch is AK2. Um, you can see that uh, zigzag stitch says the reading is BL. The red lever controls the width. This little oval Design shape is a setting BM. It's a little triangles or BN. Blind hem BO. I don't know what to call that. BP. Multi stitch zigzag. So three little stitches on each zig and three on the zag was BQ. And these big funny hills BR. In all of those, the red lever controlled the width. And then there's more down here. These are combination patterns. So E and O, E, P. Um, here's one called the Thunderbird. Setting is I, L. The Flame Stitch. Um, comb Stitch. Icicle Stitch. These were all controlled by these settings because there is actually a cam stack in the machine. There's a true cam stack. 
but that's what these controls or control knobs are on the front so for the red lever usually starts out in center position or three and you depress it down and you can slide it from one to five and then the outer knob this controlled the settings on the left plate so if you wanted to change any of these settings same thing needle has to be up out of the fabric red lever three okay and then the outer knob they told you to push with your right hand push and turn to the setting you want I'll make it E and then let it go and that was supposed to lock this in to E and then for the walls of Troy switch you would set the right side of the plate to P and to do that on the inner lever you use your left hand and you pull it towards you to release it to release it to release it <laughs> now let's see why that isn't turning Mm -hmm. So let's set Fleetwood to its basic uh, straight stitch that the guide tells us is AK3. So left panel A, right panel K, red lever 3. That's the setting for straight stitch. So, to control the left panel here, the outer knob, we push it in. I'll turn the selecting pointer up to A and release it back out. For the K, it's on the right, so I'm going to pull the inner knob towards me and turn it to K and release it. So the indicator pin is on K and I'm already in three. Now I'm in the straight stitch position and I just control the length of my stitch with the feet controller. Okay. Now what about um, left center um, right? Now that I've got this locked in, I can move this if I want. It's in three, it's in the center needle position. But if I want it to go left, I can move it now to two or to one. And watch this little needle point. I can move it to four and five. So three is the center, two is a little bit left, one is all the way left, back to center, over to four, a little bit right, and all the way to five, all the way right. So they combine this width lever with the needle position lever depending on how the controls were set. But that's the AK3. That's straight stitch. Uh, I'll do one more for the standard zigzag stitch it tells me it's BL. So needle up out of the fabric, red lever to three. So I want to make changes here. Left side is outer knob push, move from A to B, release it, and lock it in. I think this needs a little bit of work, huh? I think that's B. L is over here on the right. 
So I'm going to use the inner knob, left hand, pull it towards me, and I'm going to move it from K to L. Except it's not, it's not moving. This is uh, pretty famous for this machine. <laughs> there. I don't think I had the B locked in. I think this is a little loose here. So it wasn't locked into the B is why this didn't want to move. So when I reset that, now it easily moved from K to L. So now I'm on a zigzag. And now that I've got the control set where I want, I can control the width now with the red lever. From the width of just over zero, up to five, just like on a regular zigzag machine. So that's how I would set kind of these primary patterns that are built in here. Now the machine is also called a special because it also, besides the cam stack, can take these special pattern discs. I think it comes from the factory with pattern one, which is the arrowhead um, built in or, or set in from the factory, and then five more uh, stitches. So let's take this cover off and we can see what else has been added to make the 401A the machine that it is. Still two screws. Still do not lift by the flip up cover. Just grab the main body of the arm cover and lift it up. Still has a big chrome adjustment thumb screw up here. So watch that. There we go. Still has the hinge spring things. So now you see the cutout here, like on the 403. It's just the flip up is bigger. Still two spools, can do two needle, two needle sewing. Let's put that aside. Turn this around. I'm going to take off the, the uh, nose cover. the same way just lift it up equally get it up out of those holes you know the top one doesn't want to come out this is how the pins get bent there the top one has sunk down in there the top pin a little bit too far so I'll have to adjust that see the bottom one isn't sticking out as far as the top one. That one's been pulled down too far, so it makes it a little trickier to get it off and on. So I'll have to adjust those when I go to put it, when I'm restoring the machine. But anyway, same, same cover, same thread guide. If we look up here in the front, we're going to see it's just like the 403A. It's got the offset pressure control for the pressure bar system. It has the same uh, needle bar vibrating bracket. The same thread take-up lever. The same needle bar counterbalance back here is the 403, just like the 403. So the same motor as the 404 and 403A. This whole, all this equipment in here is the same as the 403. It's got the same thread tension unit. Got the same. Uh, feed control lever. It's got the same flip up bobbin winder. I'm 
with its own tension disc and spool. It's got a little bit different uh, lampshade. Uh, I didn't take the lampshade off of the 403. It's the same style as the 404, but it has one screw in the middle. This one you see is more kind of industrial looking. It doesn't have the little curves that the 404 and the 403A does. But I can open it up. It's two screws. It's going to be the same thing. You're going to have the exact same light socket as the other two with its own on and off switch. The light bulb still fits bayonet style. Still has wiring going up over the arm and down through the upright to go to the receptacle for power. Still has the same glass focusing lens. Because of all this other equipment up here, this arm cover is just a little narrower and more utility looking. But it still has the same over 7 inch center needle to upright and 5 inches bed to the lampshade. Still has this room here. But I think the 403 and the 401A are about a half inch taller than the 404. But I want to show you up in here in the arm. Now, so let me rearrange this a little bit and see if I can get a better Okay. There's some parts here that are similar to the 403A. still have my needle bar driving arm mechanism, right? Because I still have a swing needle. still has to move that vibrating bracket to make the needle bar zigzag back and forth. This is the bite amplitude right but it's kind of been combined with the left center right uh, needle bar positioning equipment but this this is pretty much what's uh, different here if I push on that uh, outer knob you're going to see some mechanisms in the back here moving. So there's a guide post, steel post, and post here. If I push that and get a little better see those parts moving? Now let me push it and turn. You see it coming up, up, up? down 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 up down that's to move some followers to the different cams so when it sets on A it's the lowest position back here and the follower is below any cam or disc because it doesn't need to follow anything for straight stitch as I move up to B and beyond it's going to move this follower to the disk I've selected so as everything turns that follower will follow the pattern on the special disk. There it goes. Now let's push this in and move it back down a little bit the same thing on the other when I move the inner knob pulling it toward me see the mechanism move and it's got to come out and clear on this riser and you see it move up here so it also has a follower over here and that's going to move up and sit on a cam. So that's how you get your primary patterns and your combination patterns when you set both knobs. And if I 
move this control over here all the way up to special that's what brings the follower up to engage the special disk. Okay, the other cams are built in, and I'm going to show you the cam stack, but I wanted you to see both these knobs control two different net mechanisms, one that sets a rear follower, one that sets a front follower. Okay, those followers follow the patterns on the cam, move the paddle to swing the needle. All right. Now you see where people get into trouble here is that special disc is engaged because I've got the uh, inner knob all the way up to special. And this is where people get into trouble is they're going to pull and push these discs on when that follower is up on special. And that's when stuff gets bent, damaged, and moved out of alignment. So you want to be sure and follow your instruction manual. And when you're going to make any change on these selector controls, you want the needle up out of the fabric. You want the red lever at three. To move a disc on and off, it cannot be on special. So it can be pulled off of special and turned anywhere in here. It just can't be on special. Because when I move it off of special, that following arm now is down in here. It's not up riding on the special disc. So I can remove and replace discs without any problem. And the same thing when I go to put it back on. Right? Cannot be on special. Red lever should be on three and the needle should be up out of the fabric. Then I can easily put the special disc on and off without damaging or changing the alignment of any of those following pins. Okay? Real important. Now, the other parts up here, you know, the, the horizontal arm shaft, the same as the 403, feed forked, rocker arm, gears to the vertical, upright shaft, the worm gear on the motor, textile light gear on the hand wheel, all the same. All the same. But these controls here are what line up the cam stack connections. And I'm actually going to show you what that cam stack looks like. And, oops. Here it is. It's a dirty one. I haven't, haven't cleaned it yet. Got the worm following gear because if you remember way back on the 404, I showed you on the 403 and the 401A, there's a worm gear cut right into the shaft. And this following gear for the camp stack mates up with that. So when the shaft rotates, the camp stack or padding selector rotates. And that sits right down um, inside the byte amplitude selector, like that. And then the back of that following gear meshes with the worm gear on the camshaft. I mean on the uh, vertical shaft. So let me remove that. You can see a lot of mucky old grease. But there's seven, I believe, 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's seven metal cams permanently installed into the machine. And you can see how the patterns are different on each cam. So whether you're doing a primary pattern or one of those combo patterns, right? When you adjust those knobs, it's bringing that follower up to the correct cam. And then as the cam turns, it's going to move the needle bar at the proper time to make your pattern. And when you're sewing these kind of uh, combo patterns, um, once, like, uh, let me let me see, let me get another, let me grab another disc here. Um, remember, this has to be off special, which I am. I'm going to put that cam on our special disc. Okay, and then if I was going to sew uh, a combination special pattern, I would pick one of the patterns inside the lid or in the instruction manual. And let's see what I've got here. Hmm. Because the cam, I, the special disc I put on there is kind of an arrowhead. So, let's just do the arrowhead first. Let's do the special pattern with the arrowhead. So I'm going to be on, uh, let's see, that's going to take B. So push, turn to B, I think I'm already there, turn to B and lock in okay and then uh, see I wrote this down because I'm not that familiar with it my red levers on three and let's pick a pattern mm, I think to use a special primary I'm going to use B. Oh, B and special. What's the matter with me? B and special because I want to use the special. So I got this to B. Off the of special, I put my my special disc on. I'm a three. So now I'm going to pull this knob to me and I'm going to turn it up to special to engage that special cam. Okay. Now, once it's engaged, I can do variants of the pattern. It's going to sew kind of like a standard diamond is what it looks like. Did I call it arrowhead? It looks like a diamond. So it's going to sew a standard diamond and the stitch length will be how tight that diamond is or how elongated but also I can make it narrower or wider because now that I've got it engaged this can become the stitch width and I can go two to four if I remember right and those are secondary patterns on a special disc so center would be the normal pattern, like the one you see in the top of the lid or on the disc itself. But if you wanted a variation, you can go to over towards the two, like two and a half, two and a quarter, two, or you can go to over towards four, past three and all the way to four. And if I remember right, that just kind of makes the pattern a little narrower or wider. But this machine also can take the 22 cams that Singer makes. It comes with one up here and four in the attachment set. Then you can buy sets of 12 
too and you can buy them eBay places like that you can some people sell them uh, single for two or three bucks uh, I think I bought this set with shipping was about 16 so 12 pattern discs for sixteen dollars but now you can see between the primary patterns of the eight cams and the combination pattern by engaging these settings with the front follower now you have two followers following that cam making a different design and then if you do go all the way up to special you can sew any of those uh, special patterns and I think left center right on the special I think once you're set you can move the off of B onto C for left and up to A for right after you've got your special disc engaged. So that's why I think some people called it the Cadillac of sewing machines. Um, it's got you can see probably dozens of variations of uh, stitches and special discs that you can combine so uh, you can make them narrower, wider, shorter, longer it's like almost no end to the creativity you can do with this machine if that's what you want to do and that's I think was so appealing to crafters and sewers 1960 it's really uh, you know, upbeat color TV, air conditioning, no cell phones, no internet, no home computers. So everything was mechanical like this. And they built this very, very well. That's why it was called a Cadillac, like a luxury machine. It's very well designed very well built where people get into trouble is not understanding the instructions and moving all this stuff or putting this on and off in an improper way and if you bend those followers and pointer pins it causes a lot of problems you're not going to get the stitch that you want if you can even move it there's a lot more stuff up here to keep clean and oiled because you have to be able to, you know, push and pull and turn and slide and everything like that. So there's more maintenance up here. It can all be done. But, you know, I guess uh, maintaining a Cadillac was quite different than maintaining a little stick shift Chevy truck in 1960 with a straight six motor. You know, here you got a V8 with all kinds of automatic stuff. Same thing. So, that's a look at the build and features of the three machines. Uh, the next thing I want to do is show you the what a complete attachment set, set that came with the machines. What it was like, the vintage attachments and stuff. And then at the very end, I'll give my opinion of the three machines for what, whatever that's worth, if you want to stick around for that. <laughs> so let me get this set up and get my attachments, and then I will uh, film and show those attachments. Okay, now I'd like to uh, show you the kind of common attachment set that that came with all three of these models. There's there's some slight variances, but um, in the original comparison of all the common features, I forgot to mention that they all came with this button style foot 
controller and uh, cord set and the common one that that you'll find in the United States has uh, AC voltage from 95 to 145 volts and it's a 0.7 amp now when I said they could run DC voltage um, what I meant was that the motors and controllers you could order set up for DC current in different voltages. Uh, I, I'm not sure why, I'm a pretty old guy, but I don't ever remember running DC voltage in a house. But, you know, I, I, I know that they were available. But that is that is the common foot pedal. Um, it was made so that you rest your foot here and you kind of rock it over on the button that uh, controls the power feed. And then it could also be mounted into a cabinet uh, with a knee lever and a mechanism that when you move the knee lever pushed on this button. So there's that. And here this is the uh, setup for the 403. This is real common to the 404 and the 401A I think may have come with a plastic hinged box, maybe. Um, I, I'm not sure if that plastic box didn't come out until the 500A or if it started with the 401A. But the attachments would have been the same regardless of what kind of box it came into. So let me, uh, uh, anyway, this is the paper box or cardboard box. It's very common and uh, shows you this is the set for the 403. And all these um, attachment sets had a part number. And all of the machines came with a paper um, instruction manual. And they were actually quite nice. They had, they had the pictures. They described the machine, talked about the features. They uh, had needle and fabric and thread type charts that uh, telling you that these machines could use the catalog 2020 needle or now known as the 15x1 uh, in needle sizes 9, 11, 14, 16 and 18 so quite a variety of fabrics and needle sizes um, it, it also described the um, you know how to thread it what, what all the parts were how to wind bobbins Probably many of you have seen these before, um, but it, it was nicely done. Uh, this one is, I don't know, about 80, 94, 96 pages, index in the back, showing you how to change light bulbs, how to use the different attachments, how to oil it, and so forth. Nowadays, you can go to singerco.com, singerco.com, and click on their support button, and click on their instruction manual button, and enter your model number into the box without any alpha char characters, like you would just enter 403 or 401, and then it will bring up a list of free downloadable instruction manuals based on the number and there, there might be more than one for example if you put in 403 it would certainly come up with the manual for 403 but if there was a model like 4032 it might show that too but anyway you click on the button and you download a, a free PDF portable document file of the of the original manual so 
let me go through some of the feet here. Um, well, yeah, let me go through the feet first. Let me get up here. I put this towel so maybe a white background would help them show up more. And first I'll go through what all three machines included. And then I'll go through the zigzag machines with what extra they included. They all had a uh, straight stitch presser foot and that was designed to be used with the straight stitch needle plate the one with the little hole and then this presser foot I mean it barely had room for the needle to go into that hole and the idea was to keep the fabric nice and flat and so a very fine straight stitch. You can stro sew a straight stitch with the multi-purpose foot and with the multi-purpose needle plate, but if you want the best looking straight stitch, you would use this a straight stitch foot and straight stitch needle plate. So all three of the machines came with that foot, and you can see these are individual feet. They're not snap on and snap off. They actually go and clamp onto the presser bar and they're held there by a large heavy duty thumb screw. So that's the straight stitch uh, foot. And then uh, they all came with a slotted binder, if I can get it out here, a slotted binder foot. Still clamped on the same way and it was made to uh, feed the fabric into the center slot. So it's multi-slotted binder and then the wrap around slot was made to wrap around the binder material that you were binding the edge with and you could feed the fabric uh, into the center slot and put your binder through these two guide posts and into the wrap around so that you could just sew the top and bottom just the wrap around band uh, binder all at the same time. So that's what that is designed for. Multi-slotted binder presser foot. Um, the, the other thing that they all included was a hammer foot. Looks like this. All these feet are clamp on, and this, um, I think this size was, I, I don't know, one eighth. <clears throat> you could get these in different sizes, but the idea was you start a little rollover or fold over with the fabric and pull it into there, and then it would sew a, a small hem along the edge of the fabric. You know, instead of a wide flat hem, it would just sew a very small finishing hem. So if you, if you didn't want to fold the fabric over and sew a flat hem, this just made a, a small hem as you went. And it, did, and it did come in different sizes that you could get. But they all included the hammer foot. Mm -hmm. They all included this adjustable um, zipper foot. You can see the cutouts there where you can get the needle very close to that. So it's almost like a straight stitch foot. But you, you clamped it on, but then it had this... Uh, thumb screw and spring where you could um, 
adjust the actual foot to the right or to the left of the needle bar. So if you wanted to sew to one side or the other and when you adjusted it where you wanted it you would tighten that thumb screw up to hold it <coughs> hold it in that position and you would also use this to put cording uh, in the fabric and I'm sure other things too that I don't know since I don't really sew but they all came with an adjustable zipper foot and they all came with the infamous ruffler Whew. look at that thing so it clamped on uh, the presser foot and it hooked around the thumb screw of the needle clamp and then you could adjust it for different sizes of ruffles and you would feed the fabric through here and as the needle bar went up and down and the feed dogs were moving underneath you can see this part here would make kind of a fold or the ruffle as you were sewing and this part up here you adjusted how thick you wanted that ruffle to be and as you adjusted that it would push or fold more or less fabric and in the owner manuals like I said if this part came with the attachment set usually the owner manu manual would have a very good explanation on how to set it up and how to use it and this foot actually should be oiled once in a while all three machines came with that um, they all came with a uh, presser foot thumb screw of course let me take one off of this 404 and show you that a big heavy duty thumb screw tighten it by hand it even had a slot for the screwdriver so you could really tighten it that was included of course with each set um, Here's my seam guide. They also included an adjustable seam guide, which I'm not seeing here. Hmm. What the heck? Oh, here it is. I already took it out. Okay. So, the adjustable seam guide on the 404, they're still metal. When they went to the, or the 400 series, they're still metal. When they went to the 500 and 503, this went to a piece of beige plastic. And when they went to the 6 and 700 touch and sews, it became clear plastic. But there is a hole right on the bed where you, you screw this into the bed and you can adjust it for how wide you want your seam to be when you're sewing. So if you want, uh, you know, a narrow hem, you would move it closer to the needle. If you want a wider hem or much high, wider hem, you would move it farther from the needle and tighten it up. And if you were sewing, um, not straight, but sewing on a inner curve or outer curve you would turn it at an angle to the needle and use this curved end piece right here to guide the fabric you know uh, but they all came with that adjustable seam guide 
And let's see what they else they came with here. Of course, a straight stitch needle plate, which I've showed you before. The one with the little, the little hole to use with the straight stitch foot for the very fine straight stitch sewing. They all came with. Uh, Hmm. They all came with four Class 66 bobbins. Um, for the 400s, they were still using the metal bobbin. And with the 500s, I think, is when they went to the plastic Class 66, the clear see-through. But these had little holes so you could see how much thread was on there and uh, a lot of people still prefer them the metal they think it's uh, better uh, I prefer the plastic and my wife and family members prefer the plastic because it does not wear down the bobbin holder which nobody makes anymore so they'd rather wear out a 50 cent bobbin than maybe an irreplaceable bobbin holder but I guess it's a preference up to you I've, I know a couple people that say for regular sewing they use the plastic bobbin and if they're sewing very heavy thread on very heavy fabric they just like to still use the metal bobbin um, it came with six needles which I don't have here but you got a package of size 11 needle and a package of size 14 with three needles in each package so they gave you six um, packages they also included um, a lint brush because they, they encourage you to brush the needle bar presser bar bobbin area a feed dog area after every time you sewed to keep the lint down and they included a screwdriver set that has this uh, what I call bent wire very heavy steel and this was the regular or large screwdriver and the other screwdriver was called the tension screwdriver and Back in the 60s, they still made this with an aluminum handle. And it's made specifically to go into the little set screw on the thread tension unit and the set screw on the bobbin holder. That's what it's designed for. And these two are what are called black side meaning they had blackened metal you can see both of this style sometimes with bright uh, silver metal not chrome but but bright metal and then this was called the black side same function but so just the black side and the silver you know both function the same and same size and everything else just a little bit different manufacturing process Mm. One other thing here that they usually included was a tube of uh, Singer Oil, a little plastic squeeze tube you could open up and go to the oil points and drip in a few drops. Um, for me, I, I would never use this oil. You see, it's not clear anymore. And uh, so, but if you're a collector or something, maybe you'd like that. But it came with that. Did not come with any motor lube or grease for the gears, but it did come with the tube of oil. And it came with um, either two or three spool pins and uh, felt pads so with the 404 you got two of these one for the top 
and one for the bobbin winding area. And on the 401A and 403A, you got three of these, two for the top and one for the bobbin winder area. And the original felt is a brown, as you can see. And, uh, you know, this 60-year-old felt right here, or almost 58 years now, I guess, is a better quality than most of the felts you can buy today. So when I get these and they smell bad or they're dirty, I just take a drop of laundry detergent and squeeze it out with my hand and rinse it and let it dry and, and they end up better, better quality than anything I can buy. So I'm always happy to see the felt uh, pads. Okay, um, let's see. When you got into the, uh, okay, for the, for the 404, you didn't get any special discs or top hat cams because it's a straight stitch only machine. When you went to the 403A, it included nine of these. One in the machine for zigzag, and then in the attachment box were eight more. And those were included. In the 401A, there was one in the machine and four in the attachment box. And I'm really thinking that that 401A attachment box was the first plastic box. But I'm not I'm not sure of that. But you got eight uh, nine of these with the 403 and five of them with the 401A. And you also would have got the multi-purpose foot. Let me take one off of the 401A here, and uh, if I can. And I'll show you that multi-purpose foot. So obviously, if you're going to need zigzag or special disc pattern sewing, you need that bigger slot for the needle to move left and right. Now a lot of people will just sew straight stitch with this also. And the stitch comes out fine enough for them and they never really use the straight stitch foot. Like the straight stitch foot I got with this set, it does not look like it's ever been used. There's not a scratch on it any place, even around the, the part where you clamp the thumb screw. So I find that to be common. People just use this for straight and zigzag and sewing. And did never use the uh, straight stitch setup of the foot and needle plate. And the 403 and the 503, 50, no, 401, 403 and 401 also came with a multi purpose needle plate or throat plate to go along with that special purpose foot. Let's see if I can get this one off here. And of course I picked a stubborn machine. <laughs> Try that. There we go. So you can see that the the slotted opening here is for zigzag and that it would match up with the slotted opening of the multi-purpose foot. So the 403A and the 401A included these where it wasn't needed with the 404. No zigzag. Okay.
Um, they, with the zigzag machines, the 401A and 403A, they also included a button sewing foot. And the idea was to put the button underneath this foot and set the zigzag width for whatever your thread holes were on the button and sew back and forth three or four times to sew on a button. And you see that slot in the center um, through there. That was made for you to lay a straight pin in and sew the stitching over that so there'd be a space between the fabric and the button that after you sewed the zigzag you'd take a few inches of the thread and you'd wrap it around in a circle behind the button to cover the zigzag stitches that were going into the fabric. That way the wear and tear was on this thread wrap and not on the thread stitching in the fabric. So if you wanted to do that, that's what that little groove is for, was just to lay a straight pin or a needle on top of it and then sew over it to leave slack for you to wrap the thread behind the button. And seems like there was something else. Button sewing foot, general purpose. Um, yeah, there's a special purpose foot. I thought I, I thought, oh, it fell down in my box here. That's why I'm not seeing it. I don't know. The special purpose foot was designed for satin stitching. Here it is. It's designed for satin stitching and monogramming. So it's a zigzag foot. It's got a big opening there for zigzag. You see it's a little bit lighter weight, thinner, and a smaller footprint than the multi-purpose foot. And you see there's a little bump up with a hole in it there. That is to put cording in there. So at the same time you were doing your satin stitch, you could do a raised satin stitch that stuck up out of the fabric by doing your zigzag over different sizes of cording that you would feed through that little hole so you you would you know the fabric of course would be underneath but you would feed a cording like string into that little hole right there and put it under the foot plate uh, under the presser foot so when you sewed zigzag you'd be sewing over that piece of string which would raise it up and make it more pronounced if you wanted raised buttonholes or more of a raised rounded monogramming look and if you're going to do buttonholes or monogramming you really want a foot like this because the other feature about it let's see if I can turn it this way maybe was this kind of uh, scoop or space here where this is raised up in an arch right here it's not flat so it allowed the raised stitch or satin stitch to slide under the foot 
without bunching up. So they made a little arched area for that. And if you would sew satin stitch on your multi-purpose, it could form the stitch, but when the stitch tried to go under the foot, look, it, it's just flat. So the stitch would get right about here and start, you, you start hanging up on it. And it's got a big bump and the, the feed dog's trying to feed it through and the fabric won't go. So you end up, the fabric stays in one place and you're sewing this huge satin stitch and it just won't work. Because that's flat and the special purpose foot has this scooped out area on the bottom for the satin stitch to to fit under the foot. Special purpose foot. Okay, and then I, I did mention that the 401A came with five of these top hat cam type special disc and uh, one was shipped in the machine. The other day I said it was Arrowhead, uh, this one, but it might have been Scallop, this two. I, I just don't remember. But it came with uh, five. So, I think that covers everything on the attachment sets that, that came with the uh, machines. Now a few years later when they came out with the 600 series of touch and sew they also take these um, special cams and when they were selling the 403A and the 401A and the 500A and the 503A they gave you a few cams but they would sell you more and they came in individual little cardboard paper boxes and you could say oh I you know I want the blind hem cam I want the walls of Troy disc by the time they got to the 600 series they were selling special discs that same way you could still buy them individual and I think you could buy packs of like three or four but you could also buy sets of 12 like this and uh, some dealers would give you this free you know they're selling a top-end machine making a lot of profit you're hesitating at the price you know hey I'll give you 20 bucks off the cabinet and look, I'll give you a whole set of 12 of these discs. So you'll see a lot of these for the uh, 600 machines. And even though they say for the 600 and 603, these are the same type of top hat cam or special disc that came with the 4 and 500s. So... Um, this is one that came in the 403 and this is one that came for the 600 okay and they both have the three hole and they're both the same height and they both have the same diameter of holes so they are interchangeable so if you see a good deal on a set of 12 in a yellow box for a, you know, a Singer 600 or even the early 700s, they'll work on your 401 and your 403 and 500 and 503. Um, later, I think they, there was another hole in this, I think, but you have to look at them close because they were this part up here was not the same. Something was a little different about it. And some people have told me they've been able to modify those 
later top hat cams to work in their 401 but unless you're desperate I don't think it's worth it just just buy one of the originals including the ones for the 600 and 603 I think later when they went to this um, you know the higher 600s I think they came like in a yellowish box with a picture of the touch and sew machine in the corner but when I looked at the discs they were the same and I put one in that 503 and it, and it worked fine so that's um, attachments s setups for these three uh, machines so I'm going to reset this and come back. I'm going to give you my personal opinion uh, on the machines with a disclaimer that it is just my opinion and it may not be worth jack to you. But if you're interested from a point of view of a guy who's worked on the machine for years and restores them, it might be interesting to you. So stay tuned for, the, for that. For my opinions on these machines, these are some of the nicest vintage Singer machines you could own. They're all very well made. They all work very well. They're all strong. They all have steel driving gears and the Textilite handwheel gear with the internal motor. Very nice, strong, versatile machines. The 404 is my favorite Singer straight stitch machine um, by far. Now I get plenty of arguments from the owners of the 201 and the 301, 301A that tell me hey if, if these machines were the Cadillacs the 201 is the Rolls Royce of straight stitch machines because it's a gear driven motor and it makes a finer um, straight stitch than this machine does the 404 and the owners of the 301A say they don't like the rotary hook with the drop in bobbin they like the vertical hook underneath the edge of the 301 because they feel it makes a better straight stitch and that the thread is straighter and that with the rotary hook the hooking the thread and wrapping it around the needle thread or wrapping it around the bobbin thread makes like a twist in the thread and it's not as nice but I have seen my wife sew plenty of straight stitch on the 301A and the 404 and they look very beautiful both of them so some of it is the type of thread you use and what the twist on the thread and these machines were were designed for wrapped spools of thread to sit on here and just pull that wrapping straight off and a lot of people use small spools where the thread is I don't know like in a figure eight pattern like in the big um, big big um, spools of thread that have a thousand meters and when that pulls off it's coming off in a twist so I think that that's part of it. But anyway, that's just uh, my opinion. Uh, the 301A is a gorgeous machine. My wife has one, uses it a lot. Um, I can fix up and sell a 301 for more money than the, than the 404, that's for sure. It's a favorite and uh, I can get about a hundred bucks more for it. But I guess part of that is this, the heavy dutiness of this. Let's look at uh, the 403 here for a second. 
and I'll show you in here in the nose. Look, what what a what a beautiful uh, heavy machine. Look at all the metal. It's gorgeous. Can't go wrong with the 403A. You see this uh, presser bar bushing? Hmm, oh, nice. Hmm. Look at that big thumb screw. Gorgeous presser foot. Now the needle bar bushing is up in here in this part. Okay. So you see the needle bar disappears into the body comes out of the body well there's a metal bushing in there to guide it that's why you put oil in there very nice machine but this is why they called the Singer 404 the heavy duty straight stitch machine okay you see this same bushing here, just a little thicker. You see this part here is uh, taller, more reinforced. Now look at the bushing on this needle bar. The other one, the bushing, you can't see it because it's only inside the body. And look at this bushing. It's almost an inch above and below the body. Look at the size of that bushing for the needle bar. I mean, it's, it's huge. The uh, needle bar link and the needle bar uh, counter weight is a little bit thicker and heavier. And the, and the shafts and every, everything I showed you. So that's why this was considered a heavy duty. So if you're a crafter, and I mean, if you're going to sew quilts, go after that 301A. Yippee. It's light. You can lift it out of a cradle in the cabinet, and you can get a carrying case for it. Just carry it by the handle. It weighs 16 pounds. Away you go. If you want to get into a machine that can do sewing like that, plus handle heavier crafting ballistic nylon and on and on um, you know that's what this 404 was made for I mean why come out two or three years later and try and replace the 301 it was still selling they don't want to replace it they said hey for this 400 generation you know the 301 is great what are we gonna do okay We'll make another straight stitch mas machine, but we'll make it heavy duty. So that's why I like the 404. That's all. Now, for the 403A, and eh, get this over here. Let me zoom back out a little. For the for the 403A and the 401A. Um, I prefer the 403A and the reason why is the the motor system the gearing system the lever system the shaft the tension the bobbin winder all of that is all the same it's all the same so the difference in the build is this has a pattern selector instead of a camshaft on the 403 and it can only take one uh, special disc at a time of course the 401A we went through that it has seven metal uh, cams a true cam stack built in and it can take special discs also so there's just tons of patterns um, I'm trying to think what it is. I think once you get past the C, like D through J, you can make a combo pattern with everything on the right side, K up through R and special. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So for one, two, three, four, five, 
you can have nine different settings that's 45 you know kind of like combo settings and special disc combinations this there is a total of 22 cams you know so the difference is this pull this push that turn it pull this push that turn it move this move the red lever this you go to straight stitch pull out your zigzag cam put in your walls of Troy cam uh, set the width of the pattern that you want and the stitch length that you want and so uh, when you're done back to straight stitch pull out the walls of Troy put in your zigzag cam and away you go and to me it's just more reliable there's only 300,000 of these so at the most they would have made uh, what did I say 300,000 of these right so you can find these a lot cheaper than a 401A and they'll do many of the same patterns as the 401A by using these inexpensive top hat cams or special discs. There's a lot less parts in here to go wrong. You rarely hear of a problem with this. If it is, it's something like the left center right mechanism and I'll open it up and it's all dirty. It's dry as my scalp. You know, nobody's ever cleaned it. Nobody's ever taken the old oil out, put some fresh Singer oil in there. Uh, things like that. But even that is very rare. The 401A, I constantly hear this. I can't move. I can't move the dial. My dial is stuck. I can't get the, I can't get the disc out. My red lever won't move. Um, you know, I, I set it for the way on the, on the chart up here. And I try and sew this, and the pattern comes out totally different. I mean, it's really whacked. You know? I, I got this. I cleaned it all up. I was using it. I pulled out the special disc and put in another. And now I, now it won't work. Now the special, none of the specials will work. I pulled it out, tried five different ones. It won't do. It won't go. So I put the original back in. Now it doesn't work. And that's misuse and lack of maintenance. There's a lot of moving parts up there that have you saw how how thin those metal cams were. And that little follower has to hit perfect. You know, you're gonna set it to D or F or H. It's got to come perfect on that cam to make that pattern. And when people forget to put it the red lever on three and move the inner knob off of special before they pull out and put in a disc. Man, I have seen a lot of bent followers and lifter pins and stuff like that. So, as I mentioned before, you know, if this is the Cadillac, it took a lot more maintenance of fully loaded Cadillac than a little Chevy, you know, six cylinder sedan with a three speed column shift and a AM radio and a heater you know in the Cadillac with automatic transmission and uh, air conditioning and power this and power that and automatic this took a lot more uh, maintenance so to me this machine's kind of overkill to me it's uh, you're more likely to have problems with it but the machine can be cleaned and maintained properly and will sew beautifully. And if you'd like the availability of all of these patterns, you know, like if, if 22 patterns aren't enough for you and you want 45, then go for it. Just, just clean it and keep it maintained and keep it lubricated. Um, if, when I searched Google the, or YouTube the other day on the 401A, it came up with over 3,800 videos. 
and I've seen in forums and I get people uh, you know emailing me on my email channel oh thanks for the video on the 403 I have a 401a and this won't work and that won't work and this this used to work and now it doesn't can you help me and of course there's three and a half times as many of these made than than the 403a so you know of course there's more of them out there but it was still hyped it's still a very favorite machine and it's still a wonderful machine but for me if I want a straight stitch machine my first choice is the 404 my second choice is the 301 if I want a uh, zigzag machine I'm gonna go with the 403A and get some of the special discs for some patterns. That's my first choice. My second choice would probably be the 347, 348. Um, if I wanted a portable, I'd go with a Genie 352. It's a great, great little machine in the Singer line. Um, so they're all great. I don't mean to turn you off of the 401A. I'm just saying what my experience has been and what my preference would be. And, you know, that and whatever, six bucks, I'll get you a cappuccino at some place nowadays. So thanks for tuning in. Uh, I always appreciate that. And uh, I'll put some... Uh, links in the description below the video and maybe on the end of the video I'll put some links to a couple other or maybe just my main channel so if if you you know feel free to make a comment and uh, feel free to ask a question you can comment on the channel you can email me on the channel go to the about page look for my email address you can like, you can dislike, you can subscribe. Uh, if you're tired of my long, boring videos, you can unsubscribe. <laughs> but I appreciate you tuning in, and I hope to share some knowledge and uh, pay it forward. Have a great year in 2018. Take care.